This is Art Sense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Keith Tyson. Tyson has become known for a highly diverse body of work, which includes drawing, painting, installation, and sculpture. He's interested in how art emerges from the combination of information systems and physical processes that surround us every day. This has resulted in explorations that include daily responses to his surroundings, artistic representations of mathematical equations, and paintings based on programmable inputs. In our conversation, I referred to his show at Hauser & Wirth in New York. That show has since concluded, but you can see images and installation views at the link provided in the episode notes. And now, walking the line between order and chaos with Keith Tyson. Keith Tyson, thank you for joining me this week on the Art Sense podcast. Keith, lots of times when I have artists on, I like to start with the same hypothetical question, which is, Keith, if you're at a dinner party and seated next to somebody you've never met before and they ask you what you do, how do you describe to them your work and and what it looks like? (laughs) Um. I would, I guess I'd just say that I was an artist. And um, the next question that usually follows is, what medium do you work in or or what do you actually do? And I would have to say lots of things, very diverse in my approach. Uh, It touches on mathematics, painting, uh, sculpture. Uh, Basically, I'm interested in uh, generative, the way in which things come into being, something like that. I've had that conversation many times. (laughs) (laughs) Do you ever take out your phone and and show them on Instagram to give them an idea? I mean, is is it easier to have that conversation now than it was, say, 20 years ago? Sure, because you can show an array of things now quite quickly. You know, you can just pull them out of your pocket. Well, before you'd be talking about, well, do you use oil or acrylic or is it figurative or people or for your imagination and so on? It depends on who you're talking to, obviously, if it's somebody who's, who's educated in art or whether it's somebody in the street and so on. So it seems like a lot of times when folks sit down and have a conversation with you about your career and where you've been and where you're going, it seems like the topic of the art machine always comes up because it seems like kind of a good point of reference. Can you kind of explain what that project was and how that sent you on a course where your work is now? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite an old project now. You know, It's something that I started in uh, college. Uh, I I didn't take a conventional route. I, I left the shipyards where I used to work uh, as a, for apprenticeship on nuclear submarines in about 89. And uh, I got to art college relatively naive and was introduced to a, a lot of conceptual art, solar wit and, and so on, and the idea that there's these ideas that generate works. And I was kind of interested in coding from a kid, and I sort of put the two together and thought that I could... Uh, perhaps create some generative system or set of rules that could come up with ideas for me. Um, And I would interpret those and create them. And so this thing was uh, partially on computers. It was programmed in a language called Prolog, which is very good at nesting words and and dealing with sort of uh, hierarchies of language. And and I began to produce these pieces of work that that had radically different styles and different uh, approaches. And I had those as representing me. You know, that was, I wasn't representing myself or my own personal interests or idiosyncrasies. I was trying to just create this philosophical phenomena of something that was neither deterministically created by nature and neither was it from my emotional or aesthetic preferences. Um, and so I, I kind of did that for about 10 years, um, right up until, I guess, the dot com crash. And then I, I, I became less interested in it because people were fetishizing the, the um, technology, I guess, more than the ideas behind it or mm. something. And so what, what would the output look like there? You know, you mentioned Solowit and, you know, if I, yeah. you know, if you go to like the Art Institute of Chicago, you know, they'll, they'll have the piece executed on the wall and next to it, they'll uh, show you what that recipe looked like. I mean, well, the output from the art machine, was it was it more like a prompt or was it a series of bounds and limitations and 
and things to riff off of? Uh, well, it, it's easiest to explain if you if I explain the sort of methodology of how it worked, because then you sort of see it, because it, it had sort of stages in the same way that somebody might do a preparatory sketch and then they might have a study and a painting. Uh, the initial output is just a set of weightings of nodes and possible pathways on a huge flow chart. So it's actually a list of numbers and, and uh, variables and things. So you it wouldn't really look like anything recognizable. And then you would fill in these um, these various variables with, with either phrases, words. Um, sometimes it was a physical process. And then you'd end up with an output sheet, which told you the instructions of what you were to do. Um, into, it could be a physical process like pour some paint onto a certain stretcher, or it could be something which was much, much more language-based. Uh, for instance, um, it, it had uh, one particular pathway you could go down. It would take a review of a film and it would change all the nouns and keep the kind of semantic structure, and you would end up with a kind of narrative sculpture from that. So there were thousands of different ways it could come up with things. And I would go around and see exhibitions, see artists work, and I'd think, well, how could I automate making that particular form? So I was dealing with the kind of form of the work and then the sort of um, reasons for it coming into being or a method of, get, of bringing it into being. So that's, that sounds a little nebulous, but that's kind of what it, what it was. No, but you know, I think, like I said, the, the project was... 20 years ago, but you know, when you use the word nebulous, I mean, I, th I think that's a word that we can still tie to your work today, right? I mean, it's yeah. your work almost seems to be like a simulation of the universe. You know, uh, our the world around us works within the bounds of these rules of Newtonian laws of physics, but there's chaos and chance. And, and even though we're past the art machine, I feel like your work still touches on those things would you agree yeah absolutely I, because I, I feel that the art machine was just one particular method what i'm really interested in is the idea of emergence how things emerge how complexity ideas meaning uh, beauty all emerges from various systems whether they're natural sociological mathematical and so almost everything I do is dealing with that idea. I, I don't have a, a, a kind of brand or a particular thing I'm trying to achieve. I'm, I'm trying to mimic or I guess um, sort of interwine, interweave with the systems of the world, you know, the interdependence of the world. When I think about just uh, how a painting comes into being, let's say I, I paint a painting of a Coca-Cola can. The, the, the number of coincidences and um, interconnections required for that thing to look the way it looks, uh, history, your parents meeting, the paints that are ground and the chemicals they've come from. And to me, it's a, a sort of exploration, almost mystical ex exploration of that idea that art emerges from the universe. And we as artists are really uh, custodians of that, of, of processes and we can channel or find a sweet spot between control and chaos to 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 let art emerge. Um, I, I don't really believe I have. It's funny at the start of this podcast uh, before we were speaking, you said no one knows a bit more about Keith Tyson than Keith Tyson, and I would argue that's that's probably the opposite is true. Uh, I don't think any of us really understands ourselves fully. And and I, when I first started making art, when I went to art college, I was very naive, being coming from a shipyard, very earnest. And I was presented with a lot of um, critical theory, you know, Derrida and death of the author and all this stuff. And I found it very debilitating. So these were my ways of trying to get back to what I thought art should be about, which was life. Well, you know, you, you mentioned the shipyards. I recently had a guest on and we were talking about what we would call here in the States a blue collar work ethic. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it pertained to him in that he grew up in a, in a steel town and saw his dad you know, working in work related to the steel mills every day. And I'm just wondering, your time in the shipyards, the five years that you were apprenticing there, that's bound to have affected your work. Kind of see your dailies, 
these, uh, you know, once a day as, as, you know, kind of reflecting that. I mean, it's, you get up every morning and you, you have a job to do, right? I mean, it, you, you come to your work maybe with a, a different set of histories and uh, preconceptions about work than maybe some ar- other artists. I mean, maybe. I can't speak for other artists, but I, 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 um, I certainly uh, have a strong work ethic, and I think that does come from coming from very working class kind of background when I when I first went to art college I didn't even know that you could uh, paint for a living I thought you had to have some utility you know you had to design complex packets or something like this you know and it was only over time that I worked out it's very lack of a utility is where it is what makes it precious but some of the things I learned in the shipyard were um, you know making a submarine is a colossal project and it's broken down into small very small parts You have a a, a kind of nautical engineering department and then you have machinists and then you have fitters that put it together. And I think, you know, when I was at art college, I was guess trying to uh, solve these problems and so that I could get to mechanical work to physically make something with my hands because it seems so theoretical. And I do have a, a strong urge to actually make things, you know, to paint physically and and to see things come into being. So if that's a working class, I don't know if it's class or it's just a, a it, that's the magic of making things, you know, where, where materials change and transform. That's very important to me, I think. Do you work alone or do you have a team? Do you have your own large process of hands coming together to help you produce work? Uh, it, it actually has changed. So I've done both. Uh, originally, when I first left college, it was just me and, and my own hands. And then obviously I became successful. And if I'm honest, I got caught up in the whole, uh, you know, gallery system and, and the need for various shows and expectations and things. And so I ended up with uh, quite a large team, uh, you know, as a lot of artists do, of uh, assistants. Um, and that, that allowed me to make more work, but I felt that the work and the process was, um, became, became out of my hands and it felt like being more of a CEO of a, of ICI or something, you know, and and I I was actually very unhappy then, uh, you know, in in with the practice, and I didn't feel I was completely, um, you know, involved in, in the way that I am now. And I'm now back to I have a, a studio manager, and I, I have a guy that helps me sort of stretch things and clean things up. Um, it's more administration I have help with now, so it's much more back to my own hands. And I think that's quite important for me. If you think about the diversity of, of what I do, you know, that I'm doing lots of variations on a theme. If you just get lots of different people to do those variations, then that's just the world. But if those variations are a challenge to your own hand and uh, you're exploring things, then that's a sort of more interesting terrain for me. So I, I've, I've definitely, um, you know, done both. And, uh, and I prefer working more with my own hands. I find I discover so many things in the process of doing the work. And even yeah. just from the conceptual and the sketchbook to actually doing the work, you know, there there's inspiration in the production that uh, it just seems like if, uh, if that, I, it'd be hard for me to let that be in the hands of somebody else because that evolution and that sense of discovery, it, it seems like it would kind of slip through your fingers at that point, right? Precisely. I think that the thing we're talking about here is is the idea of the accident or the serendipitous, you know, change in something. And, um, you know, that's the magic of, you know, that's the sweet spot when you're in the studio and instead of you telling the work what it's going to be, the work starts telling you what it needs to be. And you can't really get that in an assistant environment. There are certain things that, you know, artists make uh, that lend themselves to production. And I've used production on things, but I think you lose something special. And I guess the purpose, you've got to ask yourself to what, what you're looking for. And for me, I'm looking for a certain resolution or a certain feeling where the work seems to mimic nature in some way, that complexity and texture of the everyday world where it's just bigger than yourself and that's a very hard thing to channel um i mean you can direct like a movie and you can get that but there's, there's i think that 
the kind of core spine of of what you're trying to do is kind of 